Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I was thinking about the way that we learn things in life, and, and I think there are probably two main, main categories or ways that things sink in. And one of them I'm going to call the more, the more positive way, and that is, uh, for instance, you know that if you're a student and you want to do well in a class, most of the time it helps to study, it helps to practice, it helps to prepare, you get good results with that. If you want to, uh, to, to have a healthier lifestyle, you can eat better, you can avoid certain types of food, you can exercise, and the more disciplined you are, the better the results are that you get. So you do something and you get good results, you stay disciplined, you get good results. On the other hand, there's another way to learn lessons, and that's when you get exactly the opposite of what you were anticipating. And that could be learning the lesson that if I don't study for a test, if I don't do the homework, I'm probably not going to get very good results. If I get pretty lax on uh, the food that I eat, if I avoid working out for a week, a month, two years, three years, probably not going to get good results. You say, nah, I don't want that to happen again. I'm not going to do it that way. That was something that, uh, you know, on Father's Day weekend, I talked about um, the plants grow and we don't know how, and even when we forget to water them. I forgot to water the plants the other day. Learned a lesson. I knew that I should water them, but now I've got two in the front of the house completely burned up. Forgot to water them one day. So it sinks in. Oh yeah, that's right. It's important to water the plants I learned because they're withered. And there are also ways that we can learn through other people's experience, positive and negative. You see someone else doing something, you say, you know what, I think in the future I want to do that. Or you see something that's bad and you say, I want to avoid that. That might be the kid that I remember in kindergarten that ran away from the principal when he was going to get disciplined. He crawled under the coat cubby. He started shoving, uh, it was on rollers, and he started shoving things at the principal and screaming and yelling, and I thought, I'm never going to do that. I didn't have to go through that pain, but someone else did. So we've got these two different ways that things stick with us, that they sink in going through the positive stuff, or maybe learning through the negative, and sometimes you can just learn by what happens to other people. So where am I going with all this? Well, we're still going through the Gospel of Mark, and today we're in, which chapter are we in? Six. All right, you're following along. If you're listening to the children's message, we're in chapter six. We're in the window, the third window back over there, uh, Jesus in the synagogue. Well, in chapter 441, I recapped it last week again, the disciples, uh, Jesus is asleep in the back of the boat, he gets up, calms the wind and the waves, and the disciples, what'd they say? Who, who is this guy that even the wind and the sea obey him? So that question was, who is this guy? And then in chapter 5, we get people responding to Jesus. If the question is first, who is this guy? The next question is, how do I respond to him? And in chapter 5, 1 to 20, as Jesus goes into the cemetery in the Gerasenes, a guy has a demon, Jesus casts out the demon, the guy says, hey, thank you, Jesus, I want to follow you. And Jesus says, no, not now, go back to your hometown, the Decapolis, and tell everyone about the good things that have happened to you, because the kingdom, the reign of God, has come near to you. A positive response in faith to Jesus. And then we had 21 to 43 of chapter 5. Jesus and Jairus, which I talked about, it's in the window over there if you want to see it again on your way out, or if you're right next to it, you can look at it now, but if you're up here, you can't move. Uh, and then Jesus, the woman with the flow of blood, she believes, she trusts that if she touches even the hem of his garment, that she will be healed, and boom, immediately, in Mark's gospel, she is healed. And then Jesus raises Jairus' daughter from the dead, immediately, she's up, She's good, and the people amazed were amazed at what Jesus could do. Who is he? How do I respond to him? Chapter 5, 3, positive examples of how to respond to Jesus in faith. But Mark, and the Holy Spirit working through Mark, says before we stop looking at how people respond to Jesus, let's have a fourth example of how people will respond to Jesus. But in chapter 6, 
It's not the positive response of faith. Jesus comes to his hometown, the place where people are familiar with him. He's in, what was his hometown again? Nazareth. All right, making sure you're paying attention. He was in Nazareth. He goes in there. He's in the, preaching in the synagogue, and the people say, uh, uh, where did he get these things that he's doing? What is this wisdom that's given to him? How does he do these mighty works? And then, and it says they took offense at him. He said, wait a minute. Isn't this the son of Mary? Isn't this, isn't this the carpenter? That's what they say first. The son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon and his sisters are here with us. Yeah, we know this guy. Took offense at him. You see, it's exactly the opposite response of those three people in chapter 5. Who is this? The disciples asked. In chapter 5, this is the guy who brings the reign of God near to us. They respond in faith. Who is this, they say in chapter 6. Wait a minute, we know this guy, the carpenter. They took offense at him. And Jesus says, well, a prophet usually has honor, except, and then he narrows it down, in his hometown and among his relatives and with his own family and his own household. It says he could do no mighty works there, except, Mark says, well, a few things. He did lay his hands on a few people and heal them. Common, everyday stuff. Most of us do that anyway, right? No, it was still a big deal. But it wasn't the sort of stuff like casting out a demon. It wasn't the sort of stuff like a woman being healed by simply her reaching out and touching Jesus' clothes. It wasn't the sort of thing like Jesus raising someone from the dead. And the people respond completely differently. You see, Mark gives us three positive examples and one negative example, and, and all of them work for different reasons. Now, as I, as I preach this text, as we, as we think about and meditate on this text this morning, I don't look out there and say, and you know, when I pe- preach to my brothers and sisters in Christ, this church family here at St. John's this morning, I am preaching to Nazarenes. Do any of you think you're a Nazarene? Identify? You say that Jesus, he's just a carpenter, just a guy who lived in the ancient Near East 2,000 years ago. I don't really believe that stuff. No, I would guess that most of us here this morning, if not all of us, by faith, believe that this Jesus, just as Mark told us in 1, verse 1, is the son of who? God. Yeah, fill in the blank. He's the son of God. He's not just a simple carpenter, but the Son of God. And we believe that by faith, and yet this gospel lesson still has a huge impact on us. At least I hope it does. Because, first of all, when we know that Jesus has said, I am your Savior, you are my child, I'm your King, the Messiah, has a relationship with us, one that the Holy Spirit grabs us and initiates, there are some fantastic things that happen with us. Not just a life insurance policy for when you die, but things that happen right now. Peace, joy, hope, calm in the midst of troubles. Things that happen right now with even greater things still to come, and we rejoice in that. But at the same time, you might look at this and you say, I don't understand how these Nazarenes could ever respond that way to Jesus. Didn't they know he was the Son of God? I mean, some of them, they had at least heard that he had done these mighty things. Some of them probably even saw him heal other people, and yet they said, ah, no big deal. Just a carpenter. Son of Mary, brothers are right there, sisters live down the street, no big deal. And they took offense. The, the, the Greek word is, is uh, scandalon. They, they, they stumbled over him, something got in the way, stumbled over him to the extent that in 1 Peter it talks about that rock, that rock that crushes. So on the one hand in chapter 5, we have all these good things that come to responding to Jesus in faith. Who is he? He's the Son of God. He's the one that brings the reign of heaven to us. And in chapter 6, who is he? No big deal. And they take offense. And Jesus says, I'm a prophet, but I know sometimes people won't hear. 
You think, how could it happen? Why would they respond that way? Maybe not completely surprising. Our Old Testament lesson in Ezekiel chapter 2, God says, Ezekiel, you're a prophet. I want you to go preach to the people. And he said, but some of the people, they're rebellious. Their ears are deaf. They're not going to hear. And in Mark chapter 4, Jesus said with the parables, some people will have ears to hear, some people won't. But how could they do it, these Nazarenes? I think it's a similar question that sometimes I hear asked, and we've been going through on Tuesday morning at our our men's Bible breakfast at Pagliacci's, uh, a Bible study on death. And and, and sometimes it comes up, especially uh, people will ask, I don't know how people do it. I don't know how they get through troubles in their life, people who aren't Christians. I don't know, I don't know how they do it. I don't know where their hope is. I, I, it just seems like it would be awful. I'd probably ask the same question of the Nazarenes. I don't understand it. It doesn't make sense. And it doesn't. It doesn't make sense. See, see sin doesn't make sense. Never does. Have you ever tried to figure out sin? Try to figure out why people do things that are just absolutely crazy? Things that hurt themselves and hurt other people? It doesn't make sense. It's crazy. But in the same way, it doesn't make sense that Jesus would come to me, would come to you. That this God who is holy and perfect would say, you know what? I think these are my people. I think I'm going to die for them. I think I'm going to give them everything I have, sacrifice everything for them. doesn't make sense. And yet we can respond in joy. Say He has come for us. He has come to you and me. He has come to us, people who are sick with sin. People whose lives are, are, are just crazy. That would otherwise be insane. He gives joy. He gives peace and happiness. And he brings order and sanity into an otherwise insane world. I don't know why the Nazarenes would respond that way. God knows. And that doesn't mean, though, that they didn't have a chance to repent. But Mark says this is not how faith looks or acts or talks. Look at the three people in chapter 5, but in chapter 6, it should be a wake-up call. It should be an encouragement. See, looking back on my life, there are things that happen, and, I, and, and certainly in my time as a pastor, I, I look at things that happen to other people, and many times they're bad things, and I think, well, I don't want to go through that. I'm so thankful for the peace and the joy and the certainty that I have in Jesus, and I want to learn from the things that other people have done that maybe haven't gone well. In the same way, I cling to the positive things and say, this is what Jesus has done for you and for me, to proclaim that. See, faith responds to Jesus positively and says this is the one who brings the reign of God to us and the lack of faith is the thing that says no something has gotten in the way Jesus no use for you both those things are valuable so I think this text is on the one hand meant to be a warning because all of us flesh and blood just like those Nazarenes Without God giving us faith to respond to Jesus positively, that's where we would be. Jesus, no, no big deal. Don't want it. But with faith, it says this is our Savior. This is the one who brings joy and peace, happiness and order and sanity into an otherwise insane existence. Faith, the thing that holds on to the promise. The last thing I want to do here in, in closing this up is, is how we talk about our relationship with God. I've used this before, but I want to say it again. See, we're talking about who is this Jesus? How do I respond to him? In faith, we cling to him. We trust that he clings to us in his promises. And so you might say to people, when something terrible happens, you say, I don't know what people do. Someone dies and they don't have faith. I'm so thankful for my faith. The faith that God gives. 
But I think you can even make it more personal. And I've said this to some of you before. Every time that you say faith, you can replace it with something else. You know what? Jesus. See, I'm so thankful for my faith that gets me through all these troubles. I'm so thankful for my faith that gives peace in the time of calamity. I'm so thankful for faith that assures the forgiveness of sins. I'm so thankful for Jesus who gives hope in times of of trials and tribulation. I'm so thankful for Jesus who gives hope and promises that He holds on to us even in death. I'm so thankful for Jesus who died for us and forgives all our sins. Who is this guy? How do I respond to Him? How do I tell others about Him? You see, faith is all about Jesus. In the same way that those windows, people responding to Jesus in faith, with the exception of the one window, chapter 6 of Mark there, that's not the good example. But those windows, people responding in faith to God's promise, people responding in and through Jesus for all of God's promises, because it's all centered in Jesus. We have forgiveness of sins because of faith. We have forgiveness of sins because of Jesus. We have a relationship with God because of faith. We have a relationship with God because of Jesus. So how do I respond to him? Well, for me, it's rejoicing, and hopefully for you, that we have this relationship. One that doesn't make sense, and that's a gospel thing that he comes and claims us as his own. One that doesn't make sense when we look at things and we say, why don't these people respond to him? Sin never makes sense. But God's promises are always true for me and for you in Jesus So I pray that this text today, Mark 6, 1-6, where we see people responding in the opposite way, without faith, or an encouragement to take account, to rejoice that we have faith, that we have Jesus, who gives us a relationship with God and with one another through Him. And that brings joy, peace, and sanity to an otherwise insane existence. To God be the glory, through His Son Jesus. Amen. Please stand.